I'm really excited to see the center plan come forward because we've been talking about it for years. Like, I think it's amazing how we're incorporating so much of what people want. Like and it wasn't massive outrage about the whole plan, which I think speaks to the strength of the plan as a whole. So good job. Keep it up. I mean, that's just way too much to digest. I mean, coming right out blue right here, sit down. It's just too much. 154 pages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what? In my hand, I have the Draft Center Plan. It makes a great paperweight or doorstop, and I personally like to dry out leaves between its pages. But it also happens to be a plan for the regional center, which includes Halifax Peninsula and Dartmouth within the circumferential. Now, this isn't the first time there's been a plan for HRM. In fact, we wrote the first one back in 1784, but we don't follow that plan anymore because we also don't travel by horse and buggy anymore. Okay, not everyone travels by horse and buggy anymore. Well, as of now, a lot of plans we have for HRM are decades old. In fact, some haven't been updated since the 1970s. And there's a good reason those plans might be out of date now. You can see that in the new buildings coming up in the peninsula. A lot of them are asking for exceptions to the rules established under the old plans. And that's cool. Circumstances can change, and it's important to be flexible. But the more and more this happens, the more you realize there isn't really a future direction for Halifax anymore. Enter the center plan. This is the city's attempt to clarify plans for Halifax and identify future trends in the city. And I'm not talking about fads like man buns and $5 toast. I'm talking about trends based on community input and statistical analysis. The city staff writing the plan have been talking with the community and consulting with professionals for the last year and a half to try to find out where the city is headed and how to best prepare for it. They've categorized all of that into seven different themes in this section. And I'm going to do my best to give you the gist of it. Here we go. The center plan starts with the forecast that the regional center is expected to grow by about 33,000 people in the next 15 years. And that's a good thing because it's a lot easier to provide services to this area than all of this area. But 33,000 people is a lot of people and they'll need places to live, uh, like actual places to live. If we don't do anything, that means there's going to be a lot more demand for housing, meaning that rental costs could go through the roof. With that in mind, we need to encourage new buildings to be built and require affordable housing that includes units for families, seniors, and students, not just the well-to-do young professional. Who? Me? Yuppies. But we can't just have any development. New buildings should fit in with the neighborhoods they join. There are a lot of older historical buildings in the regional center, and it'd be a shame to see them come down just for the sake of bringing more people to the city. It's also important that with all these new residents, that everyone still has access to public spaces and parks, so we don't become like Coruscant. Now all this is coming at a time when we're rethinking the way a city functions. A lot of planning policy used to be focused on how we could get cars moving easily through the city. Nowadays, we're realizing that might have been a mistake. It's more environmentally friendly for people to be walking, cycling, or taking public transit, and it feels a lot better too. Okay, maybe not all the time. The way we do commerce is changing as well, and a lot of local innovation and entrepreneurship is happening in ways that might need more than strip malls. All this finally needs to be done in a way that is sustainable, from the way our homes are built to how our food is grown. So that's a lot on the center plan's plate, but what does that look like on paper? Well, what you get is roughly 154 pages of policies that attempt to plan for those trends. Now, going through each and every single one of those policies is a really easy way to get you to stop watching this video. So we're going to go through some of our favorites instead. This one looks like a no-brainer. New development should contribute to the architectural character of a neighborhood. Well, I like this one. It's private provision of open space. It encourages private landowners to provide publicly accessible public space and important public pedestrian connections. Public washrooms. Increase the number of public washrooms in parks and community facilities. My favorite policy is 2.6.5F and it is to consider using edible landscaping throughout the regional center on both private and public land. <laughs> the part that's got everyone talking is this map. It basically decides where new buildings should go and what they should look like. For example, in the corridors area, will allow for buildings that are between four to six stories with businesses on the ground floor. Other places like the established residential areas are more appropriate for single detached houses and won't see a whole lot of change. It's important to note that these areas are not without controversy. For example, the plan for this area here allows for 16 to 20 story buildings, which would overshadow this row of heritage houses on Carlton Street. And that might be a little awkward. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting things here in writing, but how do you actually make them happen? 
Well, the first step is to update the land use bylaw with the policies in the center plan, and then for our councillors to vote on whether or not to approve the plan. But what happens after that is a little less straightforward. The way the center plan is designed is to allow for some flexibility. If nowhere near 33,000 people move into the regional center, it's most likely that these areas won't develop. But if 33,000 people do choose to live here, the plan is there to help us predict where all that growth happens. So what really needs to happen is for the developers of the future buildings of Halifax to follow the rules set up by the plan, and for our councillors to stick to the plan when faced with individuals asking for exceptions. It's like a Jenga tower. Sure, a little change here and a little change there may not seem like a big deal, but the more people ask for exceptions, the weaker the plan gets until... We're back to square one. But most importantly, it needs you. A plan that nobody really knows about usually ends up on a shelf gathering dust. So I really encourage you to take a look at the center plan. Make sure it reflects your values for Halifax and Dartmouth. And then maybe, just maybe, we'll get our plans out of the 1970s. We're Planifax, and stay groovy guys. <laughs>